Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi here in person with Trent Horn. And what we're doing today is actually a uh, talk on all things Catholicism. But the reason why Trent Horn is here in person is because we have the CC Exchange event that's happening this weekend. If you're watching this in the future, it's happened in the past. But uh, I'm actually really, really thankful to Trent Horn that he was able to actually f f like fill a spot. So Lucas from Deflate, he was actually slated to have a conversation with Alex O'Connor from Cosmic Skeptic on the channel or uh, at, at the event. And Lucas, he wasn't able to make it. He had some issues with his getting his visa and everything. So Trent Horn was already like slated to come. And so I was just like called him up and I was like, hey, are you able to do this again? And I said, Cameron, again, again, I have to, I need again, to do this. Again, again. Because yeah. what was, and it's so funny that I'm gonna dialogue with Alex because back in August, I was supposed to dialogue or no, well, I stepped into dialogue with Alex and then he had visa issues. So I had the debate with Ben yeah. for real atheology. But I'm excited. I'm super excited to sit down with Alex tonight, uh, which would be the past for everyone here. Or tomorrow. Maybe, maybe we should. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow. tomorrow. Let's just use non tense language. Trent dialogues with Alex Saturday, May 20. Everything <laughs> will just we'll just we'll make William Ling. Craig, happy, tense, uh, non-tense. Okay. So he believes in tense reality, so. Well, why don't we get into the uh, the meat of the subject? Like, let's just jump right in. Sure. Okay, so, well, actually, where would you like to go? Because I feel like you have some things that you wanted to discuss as it relates to Catholicism. I mean, my conversation with James White happened recently, fairly recently, with yes. respect to the time of the recording of this video. Mm -hmm. So we could talk about that. We could talk about some other things that you're working on. Yeah, I, I do want to talk just about, I mean, it's always hard. Like, what can we say that hasn't already been said in the dialogue between Catholics and Protestants? I mean, I could just come out and say, well, why aren't you Catholic already, Cameron? And, you know, there's the the objections and the replies. But as I was driving over here, uh, I was thinking, like, is there a different way or a different framework sometimes that maybe we could look at when it comes to the Catholic Protestant discussion? And so one thing that I've been focusing on, and this kind of relates to the book that I'm working on, uh, When Protestants Argue Like Atheists, which I know is an inflammatory title, <laughs> but I hope that it is one that will attract attention. It's hard, because I, I almost, should I put in the subtitle, and Catholics argue like atheists too sometimes, because I also do include that in the book. But the main point of my concern is that sometimes when uh, Christians and atheists dialogue with each other, it's almost as if the Christian has to carry this large burden of proof and uh, here's this way of understanding reality and the atheist just kind of folds his arms. Well, this doesn't really, this doesn't need to be explained or this, the biblical thing you're bringing in has all these contradictions and all these problems with it. And, you know, Christians will say, well, that doesn't necessarily disprove things. You know, they'll, they'll go, I feel like those same kinds of arguments, they rear their head again a little bit when Catholics and Protestants engage each other. Like, there's this sense, like, the Catholic will put forward, here's why you should believe in uh, the magisterium and the papacy and infallible teaching office. And Protestants say, well, what about, there's no good reason to believe that that's true. Or what about these alleged contradictions in magisterial statements? And that if all these things make Catholicism messy, well, thank goodness we still have Protestantism uh, that is a lot simpler is a, like a fallback or a base that we start from. Yeah. But I don't know if that's really the case though, that we can, that we can just start there as if, well, well, that is just where we start. And I think I said this before when we, when we spoke in August, but I think if I had to make an, an analogy, it's like, look, well, how could I make an analogy for this? It's kind of like when I compare generic theism or deism, we can just call it generic theism, a non-Christian theism. Because what you do here capturing, capturing Christianity is kind of interesting, right? We think there's a lot of people who identify as atheists. And then there's a lot of people who identify as Christian theists or maybe like Muslim theists. But it's really hard to find people that are just, I'm just a theist. At least out vocally talking about this, doing apologetics. You're either like an atheist or you're a Christian theist. Yeah, it's or like maybe a Muslim. Yeah, or maybe Muslim theist. But it's hard to find someone who will debate atheists 
who believes in God, a, a theism, but is not Christian. It's like you. And so for me, like, that's just kind of like an odd gap that would that would be a natural place for people to, to go to fall into. The closest I can think of would be somebody like Anthony Flew. You remember that he uh, he used to be an atheist and then he became a deist. So he wasn't convinced of Christianity. And so I don't think that Protestantism is the ultimate like starting point or fallback position. Uh, rather, you because you could say, OK, I believe God exists. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Now what? And I think some people, once they, you know, maybe they come to accept those propositions, then I'm going to believe in the Bible. It's inspired. It's inerrant. OK, I got to figure out which which denomination most aligns with this book. But wait, well, how, how did we get there? How do we suddenly get, you know, we go through all these arguments for God and then all these arguments for the resurrection. And then there's this other big claim that there's these 27 books of the New Testament, 66 books of the Protestant Bible, inspired, inerrant. This is our source of authority or it's our sole infallible rule of faith. Well, it seems like we make this jump. So I guess the, another point to throw at you and then we there's can go. There's a jump somewhere. There is a jump. So for me, I feel like sometimes when Protestants and Catholics dialogue, and like you had your dialogue with James White, the objections that's raised is we go from believing in God and the res resurrection of Jesus, that the jump to the papacy or to a magisterium is it's too far of a leap. Uh, you know, the evidence doesn't, doesn't warrant that. It doesn't get, there's not enough evidence to warrant that jump. But I believe there's, there's two jumps to really make it. You can make that or the one to the Protestant authority. And so for but me, what is, what do you mean by Protestant authority? Like what is, well, that's interesting. I, <laughs> I was flipping through this. I can't remember what page it was on, but this is by Kenneth Collins and Jerry Walls yeah. called Roman, but not Catholic. And they were saying in that book, like when it comes to a fundamental Protestant belief, like what's fundamental belief of Protestantism, they made an interesting comment. They said, Sola Scriptura is not the fundamental belief of Protestantism. They said the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in the gospel is the fundamental belief of Protestantism. And I would say, no, that's the fundamental belief of Christianity. Because I believe that too is a fundamental. But what makes Protestantism distinct from like Catholicism or Orthodoxy is an authority claim. So my main point that I would raise is, what if instead of arguing there is sufficient evidence to believe the Catholic authority claim. What if we ran with this kind of argument? There's more evidence for the Catholic authority claim than the Protestant authority claim. And so that, that's a route I thought might is, is interesting for people to take, to think of. Uh -huh. If you see what I mean, that it's not... I'm the, still not sure what you mean by Protestant authority. What I would say is the Protestant authority would be that there are 66 books that are collected that are the inspired word of God and are the sole infallible rule of faith. And I believe that should be unpacked more to say that. Well, uh, see, I don't I don't know that biblical inerrancy or inspiration is like a necessary component of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of why I'm like, I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. What you mean by Protestant authority? Well, I I would say that this is when I engage other apologists or Protestantism. This appears to be the authority that is presented. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah, that's but true. But you're right. If you're debating it, someone like James White, who is sure. If I engage Jerry Walls, or I would say many people who go to church, that because I guess you would say, what is the difference between like we have this set Christian. And within that set, you have Catholic, very varieties of Orthodoxy, Protestantism. And I suppose you could have Christians who don't belong to either three. And what they believe would be a very interesting framework. Uh, because I think that most people will, will start with this assumption that you have this canon of Scripture. And, and being Protestant, they'll use the phrase, the sole infallible rule of faith. And I always wonder what exactly that means. I take it as a practical matter to mean you are obligated to believe what is taught in these set of books. Uh, you're not obligated to believe anything that is not taught in these books. And you cannot believe anything that contradicts what is in these books. And so I think at a, at most at a baseline, I think most Protestants would affirm yeah. those propositions. Yeah. Because imagine if you talk to someone 
And they say, yeah, Cameron, I believe that um, God exists and, and Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, but I think that Jesus was a man that God adopted at his baptism, and, and he probably sinned at some point in his life. And your quick go-to is, well, Hebrews chapter 4 says he's like us in all things except sin. And what if they said, oh, well, I don't think Hebrews is scripture. I mean, who wrote it? Then it's like, then where do you go? Yeah. Why, why couldn't someone make a move like that? I think most people don't because they accept there's a kind of implicit authority. I would mm -hmm. call that the Protestant authority. Now, Catholics obviously believe those are inspired as well, yeah. but we have tradition and the magisterium along with it. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I still am not exactly sure that we should call that Protestantism. Well, what would or like the it, Protestant authority? What would yeah? What do you? What is the word because mean even, to even, you? Well, even if most I I I, st I I don't even I don't even know what like the essentials would be. That's mm. that's one thing that I've I've puzzled over is what are the essentials of Protestantism, and it's not something that I've put enough thought into to like actually sure. come down on a, on a definitive answer. So I'm. Yeah, I, I still, I, I guess going back to this question of like, what is the Protestant authority, even if most Protestants are like biblical inerrantists and biblical infallibilists, does it really follow that biblical inerrancy or infallibilism or, or the inspiration of, of the 66 books that most Protestants believe, does it, does it follow that that's like I think the that's, Protestant authority? I'll give you with inerrancy because there's a lot of self-described Protestants who have very low views of scripture. Yeah. So I'll give you like biblical inerrancy is not an essential Protestant doctrine. Cause I can name several Protestant scholars. I mean, you have people like Peter Enns and others who have a very dim view of scripture. I might say, I wouldn't say a low view. I might say, well, dim doesn't sound even better than low, Yeah. but, or, or others who are, um, I'm sure even, you know, Randall Rouser has a much different view of biblical inerrancy than James White does, yeah. obviously, but they're both Protestants. So let's say Rouser and White will really disagree about how to understand alleged genocide in the Old Testament and inerrancy. But I think they're going to both agree the books describing them are inspired. And that's what we have to wrestle with. And that the books of and that the other books are these other 66 books. Mm -hmm. I think that the issue of the canon, inspiration, and sola scriptura, I really do think those are, I, to be Protestant, I really think sola scriptura is fundamental, because otherwise, without it, so like— So you don't think that a Protestant could reject sola scriptura? What would they be? What would, what, like, what well, would you call that person? You could call them a lot of things. They could be a, a mere Christian. A, they, could, they could be a mere Christian, uh, someone who just believes in the resurrection of Jesus and— just tries to live some kind of ethical Trinitarian theism. Mm -hmm. And that's just what they, they believe in a new covenant. They could be a messianic Jew. Could, sounds, a, sounds like a very progressive. Could they be Mormon? They believe in 66 books that are inspired, mm. but they don't believe in Sola Scriptura. So they have this other stuff, but they're not Catholic or Orthodox. Now you might want to say, well, to be Protestant, you have to at least be Christian. Yeah. Like that's an essential belief. But then the next question is, who says that? You know, is, yeah. is our suppressive back more? Well, let's just, to, to move the conversation sure. forward, why don't we just assume that that is part of what it means to be Protestant, is, is to have this sort of sola scriptura view of scripture and, I, I and do, authority, yeah. Yeah, I think because you could define Protestantism as just being Christian but not Catholic or Orthodox. Mm -hmm. But I think that that creates... It's very wide, and most people would be very uncomfortable losing the grounding for something like, uh, and just avoiding the Old Testament differences Protestants and Catholics have, the 27-book canon of the New Testament, which is normative for the New Covenant. Uh, I think there would be a lot of hesitation to, to lose the grounding authority for that and other things. Yeah. So I guess when I was watching your interview, and I'm not going to rehash things that were said, things like that. Because it's other similar other objections and things that are raised. I've noticed this kind of argument. Uh, Catholics make this claim for the papacy. And the papacy is this normative authority in the church. And so it's interesting. You have one, does the Bible teach this? The other one I find interesting is a historical argument. Like, was this recognized as a normative authority in the early church? And so you have these arguments like, well, we have this silence in the first century. Mm -hmm. We definitely can't really get anything until 140 or things like that. 
But I wonder if the Protestant authority is 27 book canon of the New Testament and Sola Scriptura, and should not that authority be subjected to the same examination? Like, where do we see uh, the early church fathers saying, and I remember to, to be, you know, to be faithful, this is uh, what we read, this is what we should follow. When I've read Protestant scholars on this, it's only very isolated quotations from like Hippolytus or Irenaeus in this first 200 years that are easily outnumbered by other sources that say, well, the authority is, did your, was your bishop part of a chain that goes to the apostles? So like for me, it, it's not so much, you know, look at these arguments for and against the Catholic authority. Part from my conversion experience and even still today, I'm weighing the two. And so for me, if, if this hypercriticism of the Catholic authority in the early church is problematic, it's even more so for I don't see the church fathers affirming, especially let's just stick with the first 200 years, affirming this, you know, sola scriptura, this specific canon. I feel like if you had that same laser focused criticism of the papacy, it would also tear apart what I call Protestant authority, essentially. Okay. And so the, the question would be, like, where would you go for someone who, and this is kind of related to, like, our, our previous interview, in-person right. interview, yeah. where we're, like, at this crossroads, and you're kind of, like, trying to de determine where you're going to go after you accept mere Christianity. And you, so what your point is, if I have it correctly, is that there's, basically, there's a gap between mere Christianity, the belief that Jesus rose from the dead, and you've got Sola Scriptura on the one hand, and then you've got the magisterium and mm -hmm. Sola Scriptura tradition on yes. the Catholic side of things. And then Orthodoxy will, I mean, I hate to just like ignore them. but I, I love my Eastern Orthodox friends. I go to a Byzantine Catholic church. We got the Iconostas. We had a, a feast day for uh, uh, Gregory of Palamas, who's, who's more checkered history in the Western church. But I mean, I think that's a part of it, though. I think for me, the progression makes sense that if you believe that Christian authority is not relegated to Scripture alone, but there is a living voice of the church that has continued since the apostles, then I think that really only makes Orthodoxy, Catholicism, the, the primary live options. And that has perpetually endured, I should say, a living voice that perpetually, because yeah. Mormons will say it was gone for 1,800 years. Uh, and then the question is, what provides the most unity in there? But the, the gap... I want to return to that because there was something here in... Um, Did you find it? I, well, it, this is another quote that I thought was interesting. Oh, okay. It's about um, mere Christianity. And so the question Walls and Collins are asking, it's so funny, I was waiting for you to get everything set up, and I love snooping in people's bookshelves, by the <laughs> way. I'm always like, what do they read? As I just whip it off and just start flipping through. And I came across this passage. Uh, they would say, uh, let's see here. Do Roman Catholics believe that acceptance of the authority of Scripture and the classic creeds commits one rationally or logically to the authority of the mag Roman magisterium? Or do Roman Catholic apologists believe reasons that support belief in mere Christianity are logically independent of papal infallibility and in the Marian dogmas? So, I mean, he goes on to basically say he's concerned about um, can Roman Catholic apologists make a case for mere Christianity? without uh, invoking the claims of Rome. And so uh, if the, so they say, when it comes to ecumenism, uh, if Roman Catholic apologists believe the case for mere Christianity can be rationally made entirely apart from accepting the claims of Rome, then it is hard to see how they can consistently employ the all or nothing strategy when trying to convert their Protestant friends to Rome. So I think the objection what they're making here is like, let's say, well, we've got Alex O'Connor and Joe Schmidt here, right? I go in there, and I've got my my causal finitism from Rob Coons and, and the really, you know, resurrection of Jesus arguments, and I and I and I, I get out Alex and Joe, you know, the Holy Spirit can do anything. And they come to accept mere Christianity. And they're reading the Bible and they want to go to Bible study with you. And I did that with just the standard arguments, you know, you share here on the show all the time then I guess Collins and Walls are like, well, why am I now bringing in the church to get you to be Catholic when I didn't do that to get Joe and Alex to be mere Christians or Protestants, I guess. You know, so far you see like what their 
question is. Mm -hmm. And so my reply to Walls and Collins is, well, I would say that, yeah, I don't need the claims of the church's authority to help someone become a mere Christian. But to me, mere Christianity is only belief in God and in the resurrection of Christ and the divinity of Christ. It doesn't say anything else about scripture or authority. And so I would say to them, no, I do believe I need the claims of the church's magisterium to nail down uh, the 66 books, inspiration and things. So that's where I would, I guess, answer their their dilemma. So I think as you've been talking, as I've been thinking, I, I think mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with the view that Protestantism might, like Sola Scriptura might be wrapped up with Protestantism. Mm -hmm. But someone could reject that and remain a Christian in the, sen in the sense of like being a mere Christian, in the sense of believing that Jesus rose from the dead, God rose Jesus from the dead, and so they, they still believe in Jesus, and they, right. they have that belief, but they, they don't have the belief that Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith. So, but I don't, they, I don't know that they would qualify as a, as a Protestant if they— So that, I, I think that's— Well, what if you had somebody who um, accepts Jesus is uh, the risen Lord, but they have a kind of quasi-Marcionism? So they, they say the Old Testament's not inspired or— they only accept certain gospels or certain epistles is the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's only Paul or it's only Jesus. You know, there's hyper dispensationalism. There's things like that. Um, but, I would agree with you that you could do a historical analysis and just get to mere Christianity. That's why what was curious to me, Cameron, is when I brought this concern up, I, I, once, I recently engaged two reformed apologists. Uh, we talked about the, my Protestant atheist thesis. And I've seen other Protestants, the way they get over the gap from just, you know, this gap between Christian, mere Christian theism and 66 books, Sola Scriptura Protestantism. A lot of them just say, well, it was funny with the two Protestants, they said, well, I, I don't, I really think mere Christianity is problematic. I don't like that approach. Like a lot of them, and I think White would probably be a part of this mm -hmm. as well. They're presuppositionalists. Mm -hmm. They would say, well, I don't have, I don't like that use Bill Craig's arguments, then Mike Lacona's resurrection arguments, and then now you're Christian. Mm -hmm. Because I think they see the gap there. Instead, God gave us the, his word, and that is how he's revealed to us. So there, I think for many of, and I think a lot of critics of Catholicism, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, happen to be under that reformed tradition. They are able to get over the gap, but at the cost of endorsing a controversial view like presuppositionalism. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, I, I wonder if this would just, your argument, your overall argument would work if, I mean, because right now I'm just thinking about the labels that we're using of like, how do we label this person who believes in X? Mm -hmm. But I wonder if your argument could just be made towards someone who just holds that view. So someone who is like a solo scripturist or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just put that label on them and then say, well, what is, you know, what reason... Is there good early historical evidence that there was this sort of view of sola scriptura early on in the church? And the view, I think, would be, or the argument would be that, no, there it, it wasn't there. It was, mm -hmm. you know, there was this, this higher view of tradition. Well, yeah, and, I, I do believe that if you are endorsing a view that has a teaching about Christ, the authority for a Christian believer, then one must be upfront about that and be honest about the evidence for and against it. And that would apply to Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and what we would call classical Protestantism. I mean, somebody who just says, look, I just believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And we've got these historical documents. Do with them what you think makes sense. Like, that would be a very non-authoritative Christian view. I don't know too many like that. Really, anybody. And I think part of that, we have to also remember, we, we don't do this in a vacuum. I mean, it's so funny. We think, like, oh, I'm approaching the sources. Like, I'm... Um, Lee Strobel detective, but I'm a, my or investigative journalist doing all this. We're approaching all of this from a cultural background. We, we, we look everything, even the presumption that important evidence should be written down is a cultural background for us. I mean, it certainly wasn't a thousand years. You know, in the time of Jesus, it certainly wasn't, given that 98% of people couldn't read and it was expensive to, to produce writings. Paul's letter to the Romans would have cost Paul $2,000 to write. 
to to produce something of that length to hire a secretary. Mm. Um, so like this, but we li- but we live in an age where where the written where not even just in the religious world in the secular world the written word is gospel. You know, it's like if you get an agreement with someone, someone says, "Oh, didn't you get a contract? Didn't you save the email, Cameron? Oh, a verbal agreement's not going to hold up for this or that." So, but that's not how it was two thousand years ago. You know, the, the written word was a luxury, mm-hmm. a premium. I'm pontificating, but I'm Catholic. We pontificate. We have a, <laughs> we have a pontificator, Maximus. Well, how about we switch gears and talk about sure. uh, your thesis, your larger thesis? Because what you were saying earlier about how some Protestants will argue like uh, Muslim apologists, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I actually worked on an episode related to that, so it may have aired by now. It may okay. not. Who knows? Uh, so I'm I'm working on this book, and I, and I think it factors in a lot into the discussions between Catholics and Protestants. And still there, I think the key I'm taking from it is uh, everybody has their own burden of proof and authority to defend, and we ought to treat each other equally in how we critique one another's views. So if there is a kind of argument that an atheist would use against a Protestant, then a Protestant would say, oh, here's what's wrong with that argument. It's not licit to turn around and use that exact same argument against the Catholic view of authority or against Catholicism. And so one, uh, and there's lots of different, uh, I'll do a simple one and then the the one I was sharing with you. The simple one would be if, uh, you know, a Protestant argues with an atheist and an atheist says, well, I'm not Christian because, look, your Christianity is just rehashed pagan mythology. I mean, look, worshiping Jesus, dying, rising God, look at all these dying and rising gods in the pagan world. And Protestants say, well, no, 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 no. Either those parallels come later or the parallels are shallow and superficial, or we would expect some cultural overlap between cultures that doesn't prove literary dependence. Some things are just universal. But then it's not listed for that same Protestant to turn around and say, well, I'm not going to venerate Mary. I mean, look at the pagans who venerate Isis and, you know, this is just pagan goddess worship that was incorporated into the early church. And that's basically the same argument that's been turned around. Uh, the point that I raised with you was a concern I have, and this is for anybody, in all the chapters when I talk about this happening, I make sure to say, Catholics, be careful, you can make these arguments too. Yeah. We should all treat each other equally. So here, and here's one Catholics can make. When you cite, uh, when, a, when there are some times when scholars are cited for or against a position, and we're tempted sometimes to dismiss these scholars, to say, oh, well, these are, liberal scholars with presuppositions that are opposed to supernaturalism, to things like that. One example would be that I've noticed that Muslim apologists, when they will, Muslim apologetics is very interesting. The pattern I've noticed is attack Christianity, make it look foolish and and unhistorical. Hey, look, Islam's over here. Come check us out. And without having to offer a very robust positive case there. And so what they'll do is they'll say, why do you believe in the Bible, Cameron? Even your own Christian theologians, people like Father Raymond Brown and Father John Meyer, these well-known theologians will tell you that manuscripts have been distorted and this doctrine is, the Trinity is not explicit in scripture. And, and you'll have Protestant apologists will say, these are very liberal scholars, you know, they, they tend to endorse the academy's methodological naturalism. They'll say instead, I saw it here. What you looking for? Douglas Moo and D.A. Carson's commentary on, I saw it, it was on here. I know I saw it. Well, you probably know your bookshelf better than I do at this point. Right, because when you were out uh, fixing a technical thing, I I, I snooped all of this. <laughs> um, but I saw a book, you know, I saw an, a commentary somewhere. on the New Testament, D.A. Carson, Douglas Moo, you know? Right there on the bottom. Aha, introduction to the New Testament. Uh oh. Sorry, guys, we're in Turek. <laughs> so you want it, you want it something that's, you know, conservative scholarship. You yeah. Know, don't want to, you don't want to just cite like the, these kind of guys are more liberal. And then those same Protestant apologists, uh, and in my video, I name names, give specific examples, will say, you know what, Cameron, like even Catholic biblical scholars like Father Raymond Brown and Father John Meyer will acknowledge Catholic doctrine is not taught in scripture. It's like, well, well, wait a minute, man. When a Muslim used these scholars, you said against- No, that's cla- illicit. Against classical Christian doctrines. Like Father John Meyer is a great example. 
He is a, a well-known Catholic priest and scholar. He wrote a four-volume work, Jesus, a Marginal Jew. And so in there, he says, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in Catholic doctrine because I'm a priest. But I find with many liberal scholars who say, well, yeah, I believe it, but it turns out there's really no evidence for it. But I have faith. That's kind of a thing that I've noticed in liberal scholarship. It's like, you know, faith and faith, but there's not really that much evidence for it. And so you'll have atheists and Muslims citing these people, saying even they admit there's there's no yeah. evidence. And so with Father Meyer, some Protestants will cite him because he says that there's very scant evidence in the Bible for Mary's virginity after the birth of Jesus. And they'll say even a Catholic priest admits this. We'll read further because Father Meyer also says that he calls the virgin birth of Jesus. So Mary's virginity before Jesus's birth and even the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He calls, or well, Father Brown calls them doctrines with slender evidence. Father Meyer says there's, uh, we can't, there's no historical evidence for the resurrection. He says we can believe it by faith, but it's not a question you can ask historically. William Lane Craig has a great rebuttal of Father Meyer on his on reasonable faith, actually, on this on that point. And so it's interesting, though, if it was that stuff, Father Meyer is this kooky liberal scholar. Don't listen to him. <laughs> hey, look what he says about the perpetual virginity of Mary. My point is, everybody's got to be consistent. And I, and even as a Catholic, like if I was to argue, yeah, be, at least be consistent in the scholars that you're going to use to defend the things that you want to. Right. Defend. So, like, if I was to cite, for example, um, uh, it would be similar if a uh, an atheist cited a someone who doesn't really believe in biblical inerrancy, like Peter Enns, to say you can't really trust the Bible; it's full of errors. And like, here's here's where I disagree with Enns' scholarship. And then I cite Enns when he says, and I've got a passage of it in my book, that uh, the Bible doesn't really teach sola scriptura. Uh, he said, it was interesting, he said essentially, uh, at least 500 years ago, when you had the Pope and bishops saying what to believe, there was peace and tranquility, now there's nothing but chaos. Like, that sounds like something a Catholic would write. And if I cited him, well, that sounds juicy from this Protestant scholar, but I mean, I also, but I, I, don't, I wouldn't like someone taking his low view of scripture against me either. So that's so when I do cite people like in uh, Case for Catholicism, I actually do cite D.A. Carson because uh, Carson actually says the texts for the papacy, he says, when you put them together, they have an initial plausibility to them. But here are the problems that, that I have with it. Or I cite Doug Moo on, um, on baptism. But that once again, it's just it's just consistency across the board. I think it's important. Yeah. And I th I think that is a really good point. I mean. I wish I had more to add, but I just think that that's, it's really important. Use the scholars in a consistent way. Right. And I mean, it's essentially- If you're going to object, yeah, if you're going to object to a Muslim using those scholars, but then you're going to turn around and use those scholars <clears throat> in defense of some thesis that you're trying to, right. you know, be consistent. If you, if you don't like what the scholar is saying, I don't know, maybe, okay, so- Now we to have be to be careful because- a scholar, it's not like I'm going to, scholars can have arguments I agree with and arguments that I disagree with. Right. And I was just going to say that. Yeah. Is it, to be charitable, right. probably best to do that. Absolutely. So, for example, uh, I disagree with Richard Bauckham when he says Mary was not perpetually virgin. But I agree with his arguments that the brothers and sisters of the Lord are, G are Jesus's uh you would call them adoptive siblings, though Jesus was the one who was adopted by Joseph from a previous marriage. And so I cite Bauckham there because, well, he doesn't have a vested interest in preserving the dog of the perpetual Virginia Mary. He denies it. But the biblical evidence and historical evidence has led him to a conclusion that at least annuls a common rebutting defeater to the perpetual virginity of Mary, the brothers and sisters of the Lord. And so that's fair for me to to cite while, of course, acknowledging he doesn't accept this. But I think when it's more dismissal of scholars or making a quick hit, look at what this Catholic or look at what this Protestant says, make sure they're representative of the view that you're that you're critiquing is, I think, what's, um, what's key there. Now, do you mind if I switch gears again? Just switch. Granny. Switching gears. As uh, Vin Diesel would say, granny shifting when you should be double clutching. 
It showed Laura Fast and the Furious. Is that from like one of the last video? The last. Oh no, that's that's from the first one, man. Oh really? When I, it was like I remember when I was two thousand one. We went. Uh, we and my friends went to to Peter Piper or sorry Pizza Hut lunch buffet, and then we went walked to Fast and the Furious, and I showed Laura the movie finally. And I said, you know, it's like Point Break, but with race car drivers. And she says, what's Point Break? I said, don't worry about it. I know. <sighs> and then so I show it to her and she thought, that was a cool movie. I said, do you want to watch the trailer for the newest Fast and the Furious? And I show it to her and they're good. They're in outer space. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's what happened. So in wow. any case, yes, yeah, so let's shift gears. Yeah. So shifting gears. Uh, and I think this will be like the last topic before we close out the interview. Yeah, sure. Is... What, apart from the papacy, what is like your favorite argument for Catholicism apart from the papacy? Now, that's interesting. Like to like, aside from just a particular kind of authority. Yeah. I mean, we we discussed the authority argument at the very beginning. I would say, well, one of the biggest things that moved me towards Catholicism in during my conversion experience was not so much teaching on authority. It was the teaching on salvation, interestingly enough, that for me in my conversion experience, authority was important. I was wondering, why do I believe in this Bible in the first place? Yeah. What ground, what's the ground, you call it the grounding objection. Yeah. What if, I would love if someone like James White, who critiques Molinism with something like the grounding objection, then says, well, we don't really need to ground the authority of, the scripture's grounded in itself or you know, whatever. Or Jesus around the scripture like he would right, yeah, probably so. say it. then there's a question between ontological and epistemological grounding would be the issue but um f- so that was important to me but when Salvation. i was reading but, but reading the bible i thought wow th- how the bible views salvation and for me just reading it and how I, I took it the catholic view makes sense so this is a, a, a process that now of course when you have protestantism and catholicism it's like there's a wide gamut of views in Protestantism about how we're saved. Yeah, because so, Jerry Walls, I mean, if you're going toward the purgatory route, the sanctification is a process. Like, he's a Protestant who completely endorses purgatory. Yeah, well, it would be like this. It's like if when I read the Bible, it's like imagine you have all these Protestant views, the ones that are closer to Catholicism. And it was called Catholicism and Orthodoxy because the difference here is really authority more yeah. than salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll put Catholicism and Orthodoxy here. And then you have these different Protestant views. The more for me reading the Bible, understanding how do I get to heaven, suddenly the more I read the Bible, it starts eating away at these Protestant denominations. So Protestant denominations that say— I like this analogy. It's it's like um, the Bible— It's Pac-Man. And so it's eating away uh, at—so if if I had to—like, for example, I I recently had engagements with Gavin Ortland and Jonathan Sheffield. Okay. And these are— Awesome examples of Christian scholars. They're charitable, intelligent, and I've had dialogues and debates with with both of them. But if I wasn't Catholic or Orthodox, I'd be way closer to Jonathan Sheffield's Anglicanism than I would be to Gavin Ortland's Baptist uh, theology. Because reading the Bible, I'm like, no, baptism saves me. And because of that, we should baptize infants. And then going through a little bit more, seeing, oh, I, I can lose my salvation. I could be saved and then die apart from God. So suddenly Calvinism is getting eaten away by my Pac-Man Bible, and it's getting closer and closer, and it's getting these other things. Well, how does the Lord's Supper fit into this? Like, what is the Eucharist for? Where does that come from? Is that necessary for my salvation? And everything starts to be, you know, put in together of, of submitting to authority. How does that relate to the view? And so that was what's favored me. I'm like, oh, wow. I've, so now it's not so much Protestantism. It sort of gets whittled down to a particular... High church Protestantism, Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and then especially with the Eucharist factored in is the importance of, you know, I have to keep the Ten Commandments. What does it mean to keep a Sabbath? It seems like I have to keep these ten things still. Well, what's important about that? I mean, what am I, is it just resting on Sunday or am I supposed to have an, other obligations like to receive our Lord? I mean, you don't have to receive every Sunday, but to attend Mass. And so, I, so that was a big part of it for me. I'm like, oh, wow. Reading that and then reading things like, sorry if I'm yammering on, but I'll, I'll wrap. <laughs> reading things like the the new perspective on Paul from someone like N.T. Wright. And it's interesting, I was reading an anthology. This is the view that, I don't know how familiar you are with, with this theological concept. Not very familiar. So this is a view that was put forward by Protestant scholars, uh, N.T. Wright, James Dunn, E.P. Sanders, uh, a few decades ago. 
And it's this idea of reading Paul saying that, look, since the Protestant Reformation, Luther, Calvin, and others were reading Paul's disputes, uh, and they were inserting their own disputes with the Catholic Church at that time. The idea that Paul was mostly worried about people trying to work their way to heaven, and he was teaching salvation by grace alone, and he was worried about human works to get you to heaven. And the new perspective on Paul people said, no, Jewish people in the first century did not believe you could work your way to heaven. They believed you were saved by grace. In fact, you were so graced, it wasn't beyond your control. You were born a Jew, huzzah, huzzah. There's nothing you do. Now, you can do things to be out of the covenant, and you come back into it, but you're saved by grace. Rather, it's the, the problematic elements Paul is, Paul's main argument is not, we're saying you're saved by faith, you're trying to work your way to heaven. Paul's concern is, Christ has given salvation to all. You do not have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. That was his, uh, that's his main, you know, and so, and of course, not everyone agrees with everything here. Obviously, you still have the old perspective, common and reform circles. But I was reading an anthology talking about the new perspective, and Paul was a new covenant Jew and understood being in the covenant and out of it. And the anthology said, what's interesting is the new perspective on Paul is very, very close to Catholicism, more so than classical Protestantism. So and I have a lot of that in my in my book, but for me and other people have different views involved. How I get to heaven, when I read the Bible and then I start reading the catechism, I don't know, the pieces start falling together. That makes sense. Yeah, so you would just add sort of those necessary conditions for salvation, something that the Bible, the Bible supports, and then that's just, I mean, if it doesn't get you all the way to Catholicism, then it at least rules out like these, at least you know, Baptist tradition and these other or lower, Calvin, or lower church traditions. Yeah. These lower church traditions. Yeah. Just when I, so you, you basically have Anglicanism, Catholicism, Orthodoxy. And in, and actually in the 19th century, there was a movement. Cardinal Newman was a part of this at first before he converted to promote a kind of Anglo Catholicism. It's like, could we, could the one church of the, the view, the idea was, is the one church of Christ distributed among Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Anglicanism. And that is the Church of Christ. Hmm. And he was, I think he was an Anglo-Catholic for a while before he eventually saw the, you know, the importance of the unique authority of the papacy and other Catholic doctrines. But that was very big in the in the 19th century. Not every there were many Anglicans who were not. They were very critical of Catholicism. But there was a small group that were called like the Anglo-Catholics. And so we still have uh, anyhow, but um and so that, that, yeah, it took me in that direction. I thought, wow, this is so a good resource I would recommend. I can't remember the tower off the top of my head, but it's written by my friend, Michael Barber. It's called what every Catholic needs to know about getting to heaven. Look at Michael Barber, Catholic get to heaven. You'll find it. It's a great book that distills all of this. Well, Trent, it's been awesome. This was a great interview. Again, I mean, I always feel like I can talk to you for like five hours oh, about, here. It's about so any Catholic stuff. Uh, or we, we, you know what we should do next mm. time is have a discussion about something unrelated to Catholicism, like Happy something like maybe causal finitism, like do some like real apologetics work together. We could do that. What I would love to do actually, especially with everything happening at Roe v. Wade and everything that's going on right now. Yeah. I really believe that, that Christians should have a robust philosophical game when it comes to defending the pro-life worldview. And a lot of people think that it's not. It's a neat, simple issue, but there are pro-choice philosophers out there who, who really yeah. know their stuff. And there's pro-life philosophers who have put forward arguments against abortion. Most of your listeners probably haven't heard of, but they're, they're utterly fascinating. So, and that's what I love too. I love having working together in, you know, it's funny, the, the most times that I would have dialogues about being Catholic or Protestant, it was for a pro-life organization I worked for. It was called Justice for All. And I worked for them when I was straight out of college. And we were half Catholic, half Protestant, working at the same company. And it was so fun. We would go out on college campuses and we would dialogue with on abortion and we would debate atheists together. Then later we would go back to the host home and eat lasagna and salad because that's always what a host home serves, lasagna and salad. Hmm. And there was always three topics that we would debate furiously. Uh, Catholic versus Protestant. We were all young college students, Catholic and Protestant, 50-50. We would debate Catholicism versus Protestantism, young earth versus old earth creationism, and what is the best way to date people? 
<laughs> typical like what do people in their early 20s like to talk yeah. about a bunch yeah you know now that we're married and have kids it's just like how do i get this pain out of my back <laughs> how do i not go to the chiropractor and picking my kids up but i remember like oh, that was goodness. so great to you know i've known a lot of protestants actually their introduction to the catholic church was actually through the pro-life movement that mm-hmm. they would go and they were like the few protestants from their church willing to pray in front of an abortion facility no one else wanted to go and there was always this 75 year old lady there praying a rosary and the talks begin, and um, there's actually a whole anthology called, um, Sur- I think it's called Surprised by Life, but it's about Protestants who became Catholic after involvement in the pro-life movement. So I, I, w- I would be happy to have yeah. you on to, to do, I mean, a dialogue or uh, or just an interview on it. I would be, sure. be happy to, to do that. So yeah, well, anyway, yeah, it's, it's been great to have you on. Thank you guys for tuning in. And I will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video. See you soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, Actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now. And you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?